Hello, beautiful human. Marcus King on the show today. And it's happening because of our friends over at Beyond Sleep. When it's time to buy a new mattress, you should check these guys out. I've been sleeping on this mattress for the last year and change. I love it. It's changed my life. Uh, it's called the Vibersonic. It's incredible memory foam. Keeps you cool when you get hot. Plus, the adjustable base allows you to do things like sleep in zero gravity and, like, align to your spine perfectly. It's crazy stuff. That sure is. Dude, understand something. Sleep matters, so do more with your mattress. The Vibersonic proves it. It also has six speakers built into it, so you watch things differently, you play video games differently, you listen to things differently. Just try it out. Learn more. Scan the code. Hello, beautiful human. I'm Zach. That is Dan. Uh, that is Ducky? Duck? Duck. Duck. Ducky. And uh, that's Marcus King. Woo! Hey, I'm Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, who and what is Duck to you? Let's start there. Uh, so, from the beginning, a couple years ago, um, not this past Thanksgiving week, but the week, but the year before that, my wife and I were at a, a Ducks Unlimited banquet, and um, I was still drinking at the time, had a few cocktails, it's a rowdy affair, and they had an auctioneer. And they brought this puppy around. Why? And they were like, we're auctioning off this, you know, champion bloodline duck hunting retriever. And I've never been hunting in my life. <laughs> Obviously, I'm like, I need a duck hunting dog. <laughs> and, um, you know, I've got two dogs at home, and I bid on the dog and one. And, you know, made a charitable donation to the Ducks Unlimited Foundation and had this dog. <laughs> and I put him in training. My buddy Zach Brown, if there's anybody who's an expert in something, Zach knows them. And he's like, I know the best dog training people in the world, actually. He's very intense. And I was like, okay, uh, give me their number. They came and picked the boy up. He, he was in training for like a year. And, uh, oh, what? Yeah, he was in training for like a year. So I just got him back this last November. And um, I've got really bad anxiety, social anxiety, uh, chronic depression, that kind of thing. And being on the road, it's really good having him because I got to get up. I got to get outside. It gives me a, a, a real motivator to go outside and be grounded, my feet in the grass, and let him go to the potty <laughs> and feed him. It's somebody to look out for other than myself because we, uh, we'll let ourselves go to shit. But, you know, the love of a dog, I, I won't let him suffer because of my mental shortcomings what i mean you're married too yeah right uh -huh. she broke her toe that's terrible I'm she so did sorry. yeah she broke her toe we were getting ready last night to go out and um you know enjoy some of the spoils of la watch the grammys and all with our tuxedos and gowns on so the poor thing had her gown on and just we've got one of those big you know the away suitcases we've got like the titanium one and she just, like, way too quickly rammed her toe. Oh. The pinky toe just oh. said, I'm out of here, and took a detour the wrong way. Oh and, um, you know. I'm so sorry. Yeah, the poor thing. So I just stayed back and, you know, tended to my bride. But I did I did later go out and make an appearance at a, a friend's party. But, you know, marriage is a partnership. Mm -hmm. That is something other than yourself to care about. And then, but also, like, how do you see music? Like, do you see music as something that you need to tend to, or is it something that just is a part of your existence and how you flow? I see music more as something that tends to me, oh, you know? And then the other side of it, like, I, I like really, I like being really good at my job or my, my hobbies or whatever. And uh, music is both for me. So, you know, the interviewing part and... um you know, having to go out and socialize and stuff. Some of the things that don't really align with, like, my mental health and what I would generally be doing, I kind of compartmentalize that mentally to be like, this is part of your job and you got to be good at it. So it's better for me to have Duck with me, and it kind of eases those tensions as far as, like, you know, the anxiety or the nerves or whatever. What part of... <clears throat> all the anxiety and the nerves and everything that you've gone through. I mean, I want to talk all about it, dude. I mean, we'll Please. talk about the album, but like even the anxiety, like a part of that makes you an amazing artist, right? 
Well, yeah, I mean, I actually, when I first met Rick, it was via telephone. Um, it was a few months after I did my Grand Ole Opry debut, and I sang a song there, um, one of my songs called Goodbye Carolina. And I guess Rick saw that video, and he kind of cold, cold called me. I mean, I, I got, like, an, a notice, like, Rick Rubin's going to call you today. And I'm like, well, that's heavy. And he called, and we, we spoke for, like, a couple hours. And um, one, that's one of the things we talked about was, uh, you know, viewing my anxiety and depression and all that as, like, a writing partner. And I think one of the analogies he used was, like, how gifted like blind pianists are and like that sort of thing and how it just kind of enhances your other senses. Speaking of that, I got to meet Stevie Wonder last night. Iconic. And that rocked my world. So what other senses are heightened due to your anxiety and depression and everything in terms of just as it relates to the creative process? I think it just makes you a little more in tune with what's happening internally. Um, therapy also helps just kind of enhances your self-awareness a little bit so I've found and I like to write from a really truthful place and and Rick is like the perfect collaborator because he feels the same way it's like it's like a diary entry I don't want there to be any secrets between me and my fans because um, I want them to know that they're okay to you know be open about their mental health as well and not feel like they'll be judged for it or whatever w do you feel... <laughs> <laughs> you see this, dude? <laughs> He's having a good time. Are you not getting enough attention, or what's going on? <laughs> Ducky, come here. Hey. Let's take it easy. He's so cute. We didn't get to go on a walk this morning. No fetch, no tug of war. <laughs> he is he's, got, all, he's energy. He's got a lot of puppy energy. But yeah, I think it. it's a more of a tool and viewing it as such has has helped me and it it makes the bad days a little easier to get through i mean and when, when the, the bad days were bad i mean I mean, this album oh by the way you, you can listen to all the music it's waiting for you link in the description below but um mood swings it it is honest and open and real in a way that is scary, but in a way that do you feel like you can only do because Rick Rubin was there helping you through it? Well, Rick's production style is such that he kind of leaves you with yourself, which is almost like his production style is like deprivation tank style production. I'd, I'd say like you're just there with your consciousness and he, you know, kind of motivates you to dig deeper than you ever thought you could. Like, you're like spelunking in the caverns of your own soul and your own mind. And he he helps you reach just a place that <laughs> that you didn't expect to reach. Uh, and then he comes back. At least this is how we worked. And then we would just listen through everything together. And he would make notes. And we would remove so much. And I hope I'm not giving away too much secret sauce. But when we would listen back while we were working together in Italy... You know, he'd lay on one couch, I'd lay on the other couch, and he would just have the engineer remove things one at a time, like take the bass completely out or like take take the drums out, and we would just get down to the raw, just true essence of the song. And if it could stand on its own there, then we would get it, we could add in the things that give it a pulse. And that's that's why this record stands, you know, so strongly to me is because we we made it to where uh just the song itself could stand you and, know and that's the most important thing right like we right. i've said it like a trillion times for like freaking ever Here. dude a great Duh. song is great hey. with nothing around it here sit <laughs> be good i agree I mean, just getting down to the essence of the song. And that was a whole other, like, year-long process was just writing and just getting more and more truthful because I had to kind of, like, shake off some, like, you know... I mean, I love writing in Nashville, but I was trying to write something that I thought would be catchy. And, you know, like Rick says, like, that's just commerce, you know? Like, we're not writing to appeal 
to the fans we're writing something truthful you know you're doing something that you have to do something you have to get off your chest right it's like a diary entry and um i had to shake some of that off and the only way to do that is just to write and write and it is like excavating you get down to that that good stuff at the bottom what is the difference between el dorado and mood swings um el dorado it was truthful but it was it was um it was a real growing experience it was like it was like co-writing boot camp man when i first moved to nashville dan auerbach was my first writing partner and we wrote a song or two together for uh, the marcus king band record carolina confessions and we we remained in touch in the following year we did an album together and he introduced me to all these co-writers and all these wonderful human beings you know like John Prine collaborators like Pat McLaughlin and and the house band was uh Bobby Wood, Gene Chrisman who they they both played on like Son of a Preacher Man by Dusty Springfield, they played on Suspicious Minds Elvis Presley. So they're like these 80-year-old dudes. Billy Sanford was there who played, you know, his second session in Nashville was Pretty Woman and he wrote the riff for Pretty Woman. So just like these really just that's crazy. ultra heavy cats and they're all like 80 but they've been like suspended in time by music they're all like they all have as much energy as my boy duck here <laughs> but they're like 80 years old and um it was incredible just to see the musicianship to see the writing process and learn how it's done and learning how to be as entirely truthful as possible and a writing session like on a cold write it's like a first date man yeah. you know like skip small talk all together we're not talking about the weather we're going to talk about what's going on Vulnerable. in here and just be vulnerable with each other and, and be willing to fail, <laughs> too. That, you don't get that every time, right? And maybe in Nashville it's different because you're going in with the right people. But, like, you know, a lot of people here just want to do a session to get a song out, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's hard to be vulnerable with strangers. It is. It is. And that's that's something I really had to overcome. Um, because, you know, uh, I mean, my wife will tell you I had no game. I was not, <laughs> I'm not a good dating guy. Uh, I mean, I've got, I've got my charms about me, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, it's hard, it's hard to be vulnerable because we have to get over that, like being afraid to fail, right? And writing sessions that feel like assembly lines, it just kind of feels like a one night stand or something. It feels kind of, I mean, if that's what you're into, you know, do it to your heart's content. Absolutely. But for me, I just want to capture something a little more real, um, something a little bit more telling about all the people in the room or or myself. And, um, you know. So you go from doing, like, a bunch of co-write sessions to doing none, right? Or very little for this new album? Yeah. Uh, there was a couple that happened for Mood Swings and actually one that was left over from the El Dorado sessions. Um, a song called Hero that's going to be out in March. Um, but um, it went down to just me alone on this, uh, on Bob Dylan's old bus, actually, just in there writing. That's crazy. And just doing my thing. Let me get him sorted. Hey. <laughs> Come here. Hey. You done being crazy? Come here. Come sit with Papa. Come here. Yeah, shake the crazy off. Come here. Come here. Come here, you. They yeah. are children. Sit. Yeah, he's like a toddler. He's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> he's a crazy boy. Yeah, because he was bred to, I don't know, hunt ducks, and now he's in Los Angeles. Dude yeah. Dude hasn't done any of that, I'm assuming. No, no duck hunting out no. here, actually. <laughs> uh, his first flight with me was actually to Las Vegas, and uh, he did so great. We went from Nashville to L.A., and then from L.A. to Vegas, and he didn't poop all day. And I was like, it's coming. There's a reckoning. It, you know, we're going to hopefully make it to the pet relief area in Vegas, but this dude's been on a plane all day, and there's a big dump happening. <laughs> it's brewing. <laughs> and uh, we got, like, within sight of the pet relief area, he took, like, the largest dump I've ever seen in my life in the middle of the Las Vegas airport. And there's, like, slot machines and, like, People just like, you know, it's a circus in the airport. And I'm just like, oh, man. 
the, the trainer that worked with him was like, the first six months you're going to be his emotional support because he is a puppy and he's just figuring it out, you know? He is. Oh, he's so cute, though. He really is adorable. So, Thanks. Let me ask you a quick question. Yeah. You said you and Rick Rubin worked in Italy. Yeah. Why would you guys go to Italy to work on this record? Um, so something I really respect about Rick is, like, the like the level that he's at, he's like, he doesn't really have to bend to anybody else's will. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I guess you could kind of look at that in a couple different ways. Like, maybe it's being a little, you know, <laughs> rigid and a little difficult. But in reality, he's just prioritizing family. And he's prioritizing, like, men mental stability, which I really admire and respect. And he's like... During these months, my family and I live in our place in Italy, so let's just fly everything out there and we'll do it in there. So, <laughs> from an inspiration standpoint, does that reflect in the music at all, or does that, I mean, it has to change a little bit how you work or at least how you feel? I think so. I mean, there was, you know, a good bit of challenges that were presented to us when we got there. Like, it was kind of post like pandemic and, when I got to the airport, it wasn't like we were flying to Rome and there was like readily available like translators or folks that spoke even a little bit of English. It was like nobody speaks English. And I do not speak any Italian. Oh, um, I couldn't tell. Yeah, right. I don't know if that, if I'm putting off, doesn't speak Italian. But yeah, I don't. And I got there and like my guitars were lost. Oh, shit. They got left at Charles de Gaulle. And I was, you know, a couple of the guitars in there were like, you know, I could replace them. They meant a lot to me, but they weren't like monetarily that big of a loss. But like I had my 62 Strat in there and that was kind of like, that stung a little bit. <laughs> Did you never get them back? Well, I went to the desk and like trying to talk to them and they all had masks on. I had a mask on and there was like a sheet of bulletproof glass and like a little window uh, and a language barrier and a literal barrier. So I'm like, this is not working. I was like, here's the tracking number. And they're like, we don't know where it is. I was like, well, why is there a tracking number? <laughs> what does the tracking say? And they just said, we think it'll show up tomorrow. And so I just had to leave. <laughs> and, um, you know, also. Wait, oh, my God. These guitars are somewhere. Yeah, well, we got them back. Oh, they did show up the next day, and they were just like sitting there. Is this a guitar that's called Big Red? No, okay. Big Red. That would have been a whole other situation. I would have just, I would have freaked out like ducks freaking out, <laughs> just rolled around on the floor until I got it. Because <laughs> Big Red just kind of stays at home unless I can fly with her, like on my back, like with me. Yeah. The universal language is rolling around on the floor until yeah. you get what you want. You got to You got to throw a tantrum sometime, but. You know, then we got there and like our original like accommodations. Um, please don't chew on their pillow, duck. Oh, duck! It's a famous pillow. Oh yeah, duck! Don't chew on the pillow. Oh, Sam, you want to save him? Yeah. Save her? Yeah, it's okay. Sorry about that. No, it's okay. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Do we have anything for duck to chew? Um, I mean, Dan would love for him to chew my trolls. <laughs> like, we'd love to just chew some shitty eights. Old Chucky Finster. Yeah, well, he's kind of like okay, okay, okay any easy. If you find if you find something chewable, it's fine. By the way, but anybody in the other something. room, throw it in. You're more than like just throw something in. Somebody stole my tennis ball. Yeah, we do have a tennis ball usually. Um, but being in Italy to make music, yeah, I mean, it has to be different than I don't know fucking Nashville, right? It was like, different, yeah, because we were there and it was like, you know, Rick's place, um, which I'm sure is crazy. Yeah, it was crazy. It's like this, you know, 11th century, um, like, I think it used to be like a town in itself, like a really small, like, village. And um, he uh, had, like, the church and, like, the schoolhouse that was connected to it. That's where he's kind of building his studio, but it was still really, you know, in the early stages of that. And uh -huh. we just had, like, stuff flown in and, like, some soundproofing stuff so it was really done to me, like almost like, um, like early hip hop, almost like putting mattresses in a sh in a bathroom or a coat closet to create like soundproofing. So it was really done, kind of like, you know, 
bare bones. Like the bass guitar they had there was missing a machine head, which isn't optimal, uh, not ideal. And the machine head they had was like not right. So we had to like MacGyver the bass to make it work. And also like our accommodations when we got there initially were going to be on the same like dirt road how you get to Rick's place. And I don't know if you guys saw like the Wild Wild Country, that documentary on Netflix, but like the Osho, um, that guy who was arrested at Charlotte International trying to flee the country who had like this crazy, insane following out in Oregon. Um, like it was like the remainder of his following and like a yoga retreat place with like no Wi-Fi or air conditioning or anything. And I needed some creature comforts, so that didn't work out. <laughs> um, and, you know, the guitar's going missing. It was like we had, you know, some some things to overcome. And then it was just like 14, 12-hour days wow. of just work. And that's I brought two songs with me there. I brought uh, Fuck My Life Up Again, and I brought uh, another one. I can't remember, but... Wait, that's what I was wondering. Like, how do you, how do you prepare for something like this outside of obviously packing and triple packing and trekking? Yeah. Like, how do you like? Do you come with ideas? Do you come with lyrics? I mean, you came with two songs to finish. I'm assuming. Yeah. Well, I think I kind of developed that just from like, like co-writes in Nashville. Like we talked about. Like, you wanna, you wanna show up with something, you know, or like something, and then hope like somebody shows up with something better. <laughs> Um, don't want to show up like completely cold. So always on my commute, I try to come up with a few things and I kind of been like messing around with this idea on the piano. It seemed like, like for months I would just keep going back to this kind of pattern and, um, it finally came to life in Italy, but I had the lyrics and I just, you know, uh, finally it came to life and that's, not really ordinary for the way that I write. Usually it's like I sit down and I, I like to bang it out. And that one just kind of lingered for a while. What song was it? Uh, Fuck My Life Up Again. Well, well, I mean, the strings on that are crazy. It's, the strings are crazy. Yeah, it's a stunning record. The guy who did the strings is a little crazy, too. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what makes it great, though. No? Yeah, I mean, got to have a little of that, uh, you know, that tang. Well, I mean... Why do you think you kept coming back and lingering? Was it trying to tell you something? Well, I mean, it's like, you know, I didn't find out until after the fact, like, Rick loves songs that have, like, big curse word moments. And, like, I was raised uh, as a good Southern Christian lad, and we didn't we didn't use language like that. And I felt like I don't know how else to put this how else to phrase this this is just how I feel and um you know it just felt like it took me a, a little while to to be comfortable enough with sharing that part of me and sharing that situation and being vulnerable with my my fan base and with everyone else as, as well and even like the person who I wrote it about who it's obviously about like hearing it you know it's like you got to be comfortable with all of that vulnerability. And um, it's crazy because, you know, a lot of the record was written during a relationship that was already kind of teetering and tottering. And, you know, there was substance abuse and codependency and uh, unchecked mental wellness, you know, on my part and hers. And, you know, I came back and stayed this place. I like to stay here in L.A. and. Um, when they sent me to where I was staying, the room, it's the same room that I was in when I wrote the song. There's a song on the album called Bipolar Love, and there's a line where I say, last thing I remember was you slamming the door in my face, and it's the same room, the same door, and I was like, what a full circle moment. Dude. Yeah. That's be, the universe saying something. Yeah, it was. It felt like it was like, all right, you you made it. <laughs> you made it around that whole thing it was full circle because to come back sober and in a, a healthy relationship and properly medicated and with like my guy duck here and to have gotten all that off my chest it felt like all right now we can start something new i mean 
do you see this album as that? Like kind of like Saturn's Return almost, yeah. Yeah. It just kind of circled back around to itself. How old, you're you're only 27, right? Yeah. Well, you have a few more years for your Saturn to fully return. 29 and a half. Yeah. It's weird that you bring that up. Everybody's talking about it these days. Oh, yeah? That's the hip, that's the hip thing to talk about? Uh, well, make, it'll make some more sense in a few weeks. <laughs> but uh, they are. People are talking about it. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I'm glad to be part of that. No, do you believe in astrology? you believe in the universe? Uh, yeah. Look, I mean, I do absolutely believe in the universe. Manifestation? Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah. And a lot of it, for me... Manifestation comes, uh, I I do that through uh, prayer and meditation, and um, I like to manifest goals, and um, I like to throw a lot of gratitude at the universe and um, to the higher powers that I pray to, and, um, you know, I do that, like, in the sauna after I meditate, uh, try to wipe the slate clean, meditate, and then ask for the things that I want. You know, I've got three friends who are actively battling cancer and, you know, I just, my prayer list grows by the day because I just, I want to uh, put others before myself, right? And then after I cold plunge, I like to get back in the sauna and then just express my gratitude through you, prayer. You do this every day? Yeah. That is a beautiful ritual. Yeah, it's it's helpful. I mean, just being... Being gracious and being grateful for all the things that that we do have, you know, I feel it really just makes us work harder for the things that we want and uh, doesn't make us ungrateful. What is it like making music sober and in a mentally healthy place? I mean, at some, time, at some points I feel like I have, like, superpowers, you know, uh, things that used to be, like, inhibiting Um are now just a lot easier. Like uh, you go out to dinner and you drive, <laughs> and then after dinner you're like, I'll drive us home. <laughs> we don't have to figure out how to get the car in the morning, you know? Um, but musically, I just, I remember the day, it was like last summer, and I was in, uh, where was I? I was in the middle of nowhere, like Kansas, and um, playing this really, really cool venue it's a cool venue. It looks like a miniature Hollywood Bowl, and it's inside. And um, I, I have reminders set on my phone, and you might actually hear one. Like every, like um, every few hours, there's reminders on my phones that just say like, "Don't read comments." Oh wow! Because they really hurt my feelings, and um, and even the good ones, you know, I don't like to read that because I feel like it just boosts your ego the wrong way. Um, I don't know, but that's just me. So I said, don't read the comments. But that particularly particular day, I read one about this dude that was saying, like, I saw Marcus and he was all, all fucked up, like too drunk to play. Like, what a shame. This kid's going to fuck up his whole career. And I was like, I don't think I was too fucked up to play, but maybe I was having an off night. And I was like, I'm not drinking before this gig. And it just felt like the truest and... There was no security blanket and no liquid encouragement. And I I spoke to the crowd, like I'm speaking to you now, about, you know, what certain songs were written about and had a much more uh, honest dialogue with my audience. And I realized at that moment that I didn't need to shy away from that, that it could be real, and that the fear that you feel going up there is that's normal. It's a part of it. Yeah, you're going up to bear your whole self to be, these people. It'd be weird if you weren't nervous. Right. It and was, also, like... You'd be a sociopath. Totally. And by the way, like, nerves are a sign of so that something matter, like matters to you. Mm -hmm. You know? You give a shit deeply about something. Right. It makes you nervous. Yeah. It's proper. Yeah. But that's a beautiful feeling. <laughs> also freeing. Exactly. I was about to say, man. It was freeing. I felt like I was released from this, like, this hold that substances had over me and like you know I quit doing hard drugs the night before I met my wife and I was still drinking heavily at the time because you know every physician I talked to like I wrote a song years ago for the Youngblood album that was called Rescue Me and I wrote that after I spoke to a, a friend of mine who's a doctor and he was like don't quit everything at once like try to stop, stop everything slowly 
And I took that and ran with it. So I still drank really heavily. And I met my wife and I was like, not sloppy drunk, but I was nervous. So I had, you know, like a case of White Claws. You know, that was like an easy night for me. And, um, <laughs> you know, uh, after that, it just, it took me a little while longer to figure out like I didn't need it. And she was with me that night in uh, Kansas or wherever we were where I kind of had that freeing experience. That's, I mean, your does your life really change after that moment, like in terms of how you approach music and performances? Or did you find yourself still being tempted? I mean, temptation is always around, but now I recognize it more for what it is. And, you know, I think it's the empathetic nature for a lot of us with social anxiety to want to offer the most inviting and the most conversational and most personable side of ourselves when you're in a situation where like I went to like a after party last night where you're just talking to people and you're just kind of vibing and that's a lot easier and it's like you even have like an excuse to be like well we go get a drink come to the bar with me we'll do a shot we'll lose it up and it's fun you know you're a fun guy and I'm just finding ways to be a fun guy without that having to be a part of it um but I don't know. It's some days are harder than others, and I don't know what my relationship with with alcohol will be in the future. But I know that my career, I've prioritized it more in the past couple of years than I have like in a long time, and I love what I do enough to uh, not fuck it up for myself. You and know? by the way, you're populating the world with timeless music. Well, that's kind of you to say. Oh, it's really good. Thank you. It's really good. Thanks, man. This album does really show off your vocals. Do you think not drinking and doing drugs has helped your voice and made your voice better? I think so, in some ways. Um, uh, I think, mm, so, you know, not smoking cigarettes. That <laughs> like, definitely helps, yeah. If I'm not drinking, I don't really want a cigarette. Uh, it's funny how that works. <laughs> so... I think it's it's given my voice a little more, uh, it's a more sustainable thing and it's more more of a life in it. I just, you know, to be perfectly frank, like I wasn't expecting to live this long and let alone be in my 30s or 40s playing music. And I just kind of treated my body as such. It was like, this vessel is not long for this earth. I'm going to just do what I want because, you know, who worries about carbs if you don't think you're going to live past 28? So I just did what I what I felt. Well, that was a very real thought. But yeah. where does that come from? This I don't where, know. Where is it born out of this idea that death is coming your way and you're going to and it's going to happen at when you're young and you're going to do it, right? That was what you believed. Yeah, it just felt unavoidable to me and it didn't feel like a like a choice. It just felt like matter of fact. But what what around you is showing you that that's the only way? Well, it's all kind of projected out of my own mind, right? Of course. It was all stemmed in depression, and it was rooted in, like, substance abuse that was, you know, combined with, like, improperly being improperly medicated and being, like, mixed, misdiagnosed with, like, bipolar disorder. In reality, I was just, like, severely depressed, yeah. so mood stabilizing that they put me on just kind of made me numb to everything. And the SSRIs, just that journey is is difficult because uh, you kind of have to find the ones that work well with your brain chemistry. And, you know, the mental wellness journey is one that is tough, man. And it's tough because you got to stop and start all over again. And um, multiple times, it's kind of like getting – you know, off drugs, it's like, it's not going to work until you decide you want it to work. Totally. Uh, if your family puts you into rehab, it's, you know, it's pointless. It's a waste of money. But um, might have lost my train of thought there. What was that? No, saying? it's okay. Um, oh, yeah. So that just, you know, like I bought my first house and like one of my requirements was that it had a garage because I had my 1980 Eldorado Cadillac. I'm like, you know, Hank Williams died in his Cadillac. That's that's, that's how I'd like to go. And, you know, there's a garage. Boom, this is the place. So we got it. 
And then I felt like the world kind of opened back up and we got back out on the road. And I'm like, you know, this is, this is a, a good, this is probably better. I can go out and just, you know, do all the things that I love while I'm playing music. And that would be a good way to go out. And I have a backup plan if not. And there's a song on there called Cadillac that just is from the kind of perspective of, uh, you know, that situation had it come to pass. But that tour that I went out on with the intention to just like, you know, either drink myself to death or get a hold of the wrong shit. Um, you know, the second night is where I met my, my now wife. Really? Yeah. You know, I was in Charlotte for the first gig and it was a show, it was a co, it was a, a show package. It was us and Nathaniel Ratliff and the Night Sweats. And, um, we were played in Charlotte and I had a physician come to the, um, to the show at the Fillmore and he was like checking me out and stuff and like, you know, when's the last time you, you did drugs and yada, yada, yada. He's like, first advice would be stop doing drugs. I was like, noted. I'll do that. And like, you know, I woke up that morning in Raleigh and just really, you know, I guess I drunkenly at like five in the morning, uh, <laughs> slid into Briley's DMs because she was at the Charlotte show and tagged me in a story. And uh, I just sent three fire emojis <laughs> um, just to kind of call back on my lack of game. <laughs> my flirting skills were lacking. So three fire emojis. She said, that's cool, but you didn't play the only song I know. <laughs> and, and I was like, well, which song is that? And she's like, this old cowboy. I'm like, it's not even my song. It's a Marshall Tucker Band song, but uh, <laughs> I said, "Well, you know, let me make it up to you. Let me let me take you to dinner." She was like, "Nah, I'll." Uh, but if you play the song I want to hear, I'll come to the Raleigh show because she her family lived outside of Raleigh or still does, and she was going that way anyway. So she came to the show. I gave her some passes to come back after, which is why I was drinking to try to not be so nervous. Cause I was kind of coming off some other shit and, um, you know, she came back and as soon as I met her, I knew I was going to marry her and, really? you know, it took me like a year of deciding, you know, uh, I don't want to do well for myself, but I want to do well for her. And, and within that, I kind of realized I do want to do well for myself because that's only going to make me do better for her and for anybody else that depends on me or looks to me. So she's, she changes your outlook on life. But yeah. what, that's beautiful. Does music play any role in changing that too? Once I was able to see it again, once I was able to see it as a, um, and not, not as an escape, but as a opportunity to, uh, I don't know what's the word I'm looking for. It was, it was always an escape for me. It was something that I ran to, like, you know, when my parents were fighting or, uh, you know, when my stepdad was drunk and doing all this crazy shit and kicking the door in, I could run to the guitar and that was my escape from everything. So it took me realizing that it w it doesn't have to be an escape it can be you know just a way to speak your truth and you can share it with people instead of having to run and hide that i mean that changes a lot right this idea that yeah i think it allowed me to be more vulnerable and more open and that's the goal with every record is to dig deeper and not make the same record twice <laughs> was it you mentioned cadillac can yeah. you talk about the voicemail that the Cadillac's the last song on the album and it has a voicemail to end and then Mood Swing starts and has a voicemail to begin the album. Mm -hmm. Is that the same voicemail or are they completely separate? So at the top of the record, that is a clip. I spent I spent a good few hours uh, kind of going through the internets to find exactly what I wanted. I wanted an interview about depression 
and I wanted it to be, you know, something from further back. And I found this really just exact, like, beautiful example of that. Somebody in, like, the 50s talking about depression and talking about anxiety. And, and, you know, to me, I wanted it there just to show, like, he's talking about it the same way we talk about it now. Mm -hmm. Like, we haven't really made that much (laughs) progress progress in that long of a span of time. And he's talking about it. And, um, you know, the name of that documentary was The Faces of Depression. And, you know, the guy had the really, just the perfect sound I was going for, like that transatlantic accent and just, you know, it was really befitting to open the record. And we had to get clearance on some samples, which isn't really something I've ever had to deal with. I was like, oh, we have to we have to wait, see if we can use this shit, which was thrilling to me because I, I love I love that we had to do that because I was like, I'm waiting for my samples to clear with Rick Rubin. <laughs> like, how dope is that? And for me, who's like, the furthest thing from a rapper or a hip hop <laughs> artist at all. And I'm like waiting for that. And that's the only one we couldn't get cleared was that, vo- was that, you know, uh, snippet of that interview. And, um, I found out, uh, the reason was the doctor who, who made that documentary and who was conducting that interview, his son, uh, they uh, German physicians. And he said, well, my father's work was all about, educating the, the populace about mental health and all this and it's not meant to be used for like entertainment purposes so no and I was like just let me write him a letter and I wrote him a letter I was like you know he had the same uh he had the same name I won't share his name but he he had the same name as one of my uncles actually um weird who was German so I was like you know hey I'm making an album and it's it's rooted in like mental health advocacy and it's about you know speaking about these issues and trying to you know relate to people on a deeper level and just like letting them know like we still have a lot of progress to make and um you know then he granted us the access to use it Very cool. which was really great and really gratifying and validating that we were doing the right thing and the voicemail <laughs> that closes the record <laughs> it's just a voicemail i left briley um drunkenly and for a long time, it was like a funny voicemail because I'm just like drunk and telling her like how, how much I wanted to speak to her. And it's like five in the morning and she had an office job. Um, and now, you know, looking back on it, it is, it it's it rings a lot different. It's like, you know, kind of pathetic in my eyes, like how I was and the way I was treating my body. But it's also like a hopeful upturn at the end of that song. Uh, it's like, that's where that relationship started, you know, was like where my mind was at the beginning of that song and the end of it was the voicemail to her, you know, but I also want people to interpret it however they feel it. You should listen to Mood Swings. It's waiting for you. There's a link in the description below so you can listen to it. Some of these songs sound like they were done in one take. And some sound like there was a little bit more production to it and layers and stuff. Is that accurate? Absolutely. Um, so the uh, like the original like um, the original session for like the uh, what do you call it? like the basic tracks. I cut those in Malibu at Shangri La with uh, Chris Dave on drums and Corey Henry on organ and and like uh, key bass. And it was really, you know, a wild vibe to walk in and and work with those cats. Like, because we didn't really have a firm plan. Rick was like, just go in there and see what happens. And I was like, oh, man, I'm really big fans. I'm a really big fan of both of these musicians. And I'm like walking in without a plan, no structure. And if you're getting hired for a session with somebody you don't know and there's no charts there's no plan at all. We're just taking like these little songs that I had and trying to turn them into something cool and different. Um, and Rick was also producing that particular session remotely from Costa Rica, <laughs> but he had GoPros up everywhere and he was like just this om- om- omnipresence <laughs> that was in the studio with us 
that we couldn't see or hear, but he could hear and see everything we were doing, um, which was heavy. Uh, so that was an interesting session. And those were more the ones that we kind of built up. And uh, there's songs like This Far Gone that, you know, started out a lot different. And then I brought it to Italy and just completely rearranged it and reharmonized it. And then that was one take. And the vocals, like, it's not a perfect take, but the vocal delivery felt like the truest way So to present it. So we just kept it. Sounds great. Thanks. When well, did the choir get involved? Did you bring them in afterwards? Because me or Tennessee. So far. Oh, yeah. So those are those are samples as well. Really? Um, there's samples in that. Um, yeah. Like uh, a lot of the like the party noise that you hear, that's that's sampled. And we actually later brought in three other vocalists, fantastic vocalists, um, to come in and, and like add on and layer on um, to the sample that's in there. And we just kind of got that from some, I think I actually tapped into, uh, you know, like at the Smithsonian, you know, the, like the recordings that they have there. What are those called? I oh, I forget. I know what you're talking about, though. I just kind of dug through those and tried to find the right, like, gospel choir. And then I think we pitched, corrected it to fit into what I was doing. Oh, sick. Yeah. And then we added other like human vocals into it to make it feel less robotic. So that was, that was the fun to do stuff like that. So is Rick on every song? Yeah, there's a, there's definitely a piece of Rick on every part of this album. He, uh, in Italy, you know, to my understanding, I think it's the most intimate, you know, involvement he's had on a record in some time because, you know, I really wanted that and I petitioned for that and I went to him you know, against all the obstacles and odds, I went there and we would just spend hours every day for a couple of weeks listening through what we did the night before. And then he would kind of give me a roadmap and I would work until, the, you know, early morning, just kind of getting it done. It was an interesting because approach. You, you learn and you are a student of music. Like the mm. way you learned was by tearing other people apart, right? Yeah. So just sitting there and getting to listen to him speak. Sick. It was awesome. And he's like, I feel like, you know, he knows more about music than a lot of people know, but he wants to remain just a, li just a listener and just a, a vessel as a lover of music. So he tries to remain like, uh, like, I don't know, like ignorant to some of the, like, uh, like the gadgets and like how everything works. So he can just be, you know, the audience's perspective, which I love. I adore that about him. So he sits there and just tries to listen from that perspective of, like, how honest is this and how is the audience going to receive it. And, um, you know, there was one day where we're working on Fuck My Life Up Again, and we're working on a vocal delivery thing, and we're trying to figure out how we want to do it. And he's like, we did this thing with Chris Cornell when we did the Audio Slave record, um, and we just sat and listened to that for a while. And so, you know, working on a record, uh, you know, about me wanting to take my own life and listening to someone that Rick produced who, who did, you know, you know, fall victim to those thoughts and those demons, and listening to him and using him as a reference point vocally for that song was really, really heavy. How, I mean, what, what do you take away from that experience? And, uh, I mean, I take away that I'm, I'm thankful that I was present enough to absorb as much as I did, you know, and to have an actual recollection of that. Cause there's a lot of moments in my life. I started really drinking heavily when I was like, you know, I, I first smoked pot when I was 11, and then, like, from there, it just kind of, you know, took off. So, and all my friends were always a lot older than me, so I started going to college parties when I was 14. I had my driver's license by 14 and was working in clubs by the time I was 14 and a half. And um, always in a bar and always gigging and always, like, you know, there's a lot of gigs you do in the early days where they usually pay you with a case of beer. 
but I was 15, so they couldn't do that. And some there was there'd be a lot of under the table deals like there will be a case of PBR at the bottom of the stairs in the back alley <laughs> at 3 a.m. You can pick it up there, you know. So, I mean, that's kind of where the substance abuse started. So having that clear mind and being able to absorb all that knowledge from Rick was really special. Yeah, present. Yeah. Life-changing. Mm-hmm. Just being there isn't presence, you know. There's a lot more to it. How would you know this album was done? It was such a long process, and that's so different from how I usually work. Like El Dorado, we we finished in I think like six days. Wow! Just because the way Rick, or excuse me, the way Dan works, and it's like precision is precise. And that's because we do a lot in the way of pre-production. Write the songs, we go in, listen to the demo tape on our iPhone, huh. and Dave Rowe, who you know just unfortunately passed this past year. Um, you know, he was an incredible bass player and musician. And he played on El Dorado and everything else under the sun. But he would write the chart and make a copy of it, give it to the whole band, and we would cut it. It was like, it was like, uh, I don't know, it's like one of those little boxes where it's like, or like Brother Where Arthur, I was like, you go in there and, Sing into that man's box, he'll give you $5. And you, like, leave with a record. That's what it felt like at Easy Eye. You'd go in, everybody has the chart, and you play it live, and the it's done. It's, like, mixed. That's Because that's how, like, precise everything is. And Rick is not like that. <laughs> so uh, over, like, a two-year process, like, wow. it was just, it was hard to figure out when it was complete. But I listened to it, uh, you know, in my swimming pool, actually. <laughs> and I was like, this record's done. <laughs> and uh, I re- I did read a funny comment, though. One of those times where I let my... Uh, yeah, you shouldn't be doing that. I know. I let my uh, my ego take over, and I read a comment, and this guy was like, oh, wow, it must be nice to cry about your life in your swimming pool. <laughs> and I was like, all right, touche there, bud. <laughs> That's a good one. But that yeah, here's the deal. That is a, you've worked hard for the swimming pool. Yeah, okay. you've shared a lot, and there's been a lot. We're talking for the pool. Yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> fuck yeah. By the way, listen to Mood Swings, please. It's very much worth your time. It is real music and real storytelling. Genuinely storytelling on it at, at its finest. So click the link below. What are you thinking? Is uh, Inglewood Motel, is that a real place? Yeah. <laughs> What's the story behind that one? Um, So I wrote that with my buddy Peter Levin. And when I lived in East Nashville, uh, I remember sitting on the front porch having a conversation with him and just really just opening up about how difficult my relationship at the time was and, you know, yada, 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 you know, bitching, whatever. And my ring camera picked up everything and my my girlfriend at the time was like, just heard everything I said and was like kind of angry at me about some of that because she would... You know, and I tell my wife about this now and my therapist, like, you know, in that relationship, she would push me and try to get me to go to therapy and to open up and to communicate more. And it was like all these things that I was really just bad at just because of how I was raised and, you know, conditioned to not speak about your feelings or whatever. And, um, you know, that was kind of something I had to deal with. And now I'm like overly communicating and I do therapy and I like to grow mentally, whatever. But that's why it's like uh, open conversation infiltrated by surveillance, right? I was like, you know, that was a private conversation. And, you know, I didn't see her perspective. She didn't see mine. But, you know, the title came from, uh, uh, we got in a big argument and came home like at seven in the morning. And all of our arguments were always rooted around substance abuse, right? So we'd come home and... You know, even, like, just a little bit would just be, like, gasoline on a fire. We had a big fight, and I was like, I'm not dealing with this. And I got in my Cadillac and just, like, left and went down on Gallatin to this place called Englewood Motel. And anybody in Nashville or that has been to Nashville knows, like, that's a cool place to, like, shoot a music video or, like, take photographs. But, like, you don't stay there. You <laughs> And I went there and was like, I need a room. I don't know why I went there. <laughs> I thought it was like the closest 
I guess. And I was like, it was nearby my house and I didn't want to drive far. Um, I hope, hopefully this isn't incriminating, but I think the statute of limitations is, is passed. But I was like, I'm parking over there by room number seven. You can give me a room whenever it's ready. And he came and gave me a key and I went in and woke up at like 1 p.m. in this room with like a TV, like on a, like on a little stand, like a, a rear projection TV from like the eighties and like an ashtray by the bed. I was like, where the fuck am I? <laughs> and I was like, Oh no. And that's called Inglewood motel. Um, and there's a line that, you know, didn't make it into the song. It's like, I'll be, I'll be patching up the wagon from which I fell, uh, sleeping it off at the Inglewood motel. So that's, that's why I named it that. And then I took that out of the song I was like, that would be really artsy of me to just keep it as the title, <laughs> even though I don't say it in the song. But also, my ex girlfriend's name was Haley, and you know, Hailstorm is kind mm -hmm. of a play on that. I also think, correct me if I'm wrong, but that song, like the first minute, minute and a half, there's no lyrics; it's just music, right? Yeah. Why'd you start the song off? Well, I get, it's like a third of the song. There's no words to it. Right. I mean, you know, there was bound to be some like really cool just instrumental stuff on this record because just vibing with Chris Dave and Corey Henry, I mean, Rick really kind of uh, encouraged us to go out and just make some soundscapes because one of my original concepts on the record was like to follow me through like a manic episode and we would have like, you know, like lobby music, like Muzak, like you'd hear on an elevator like in between songs and like more like skit type stuff to kind of play and to help you more so see me navigating through a day during a manic episode. Mm -hmm. So we ended up not doing that, but we did have like some just musical moments that were going to be used in that kind of approach. The record still has a manic arc to it. That's like up, you know, mania and then down the depression. Um, and then the hopeful turn with the voicemail. But uh, that was one of those things. We were just vibing on that that groove, and we decided to keep it at the top. It's really cool. And then use it as an outro, too. It's a real story. The yeah. whole album is an incredible story. Thank you so much. Best consumed all together, by the way. So grab the link below. It's waiting for you. Final thoughts? No, I just like you mentioned Bipolar Love earlier. I just love how it's six minutes. You're like, I'm not cutting this down. Let's just go. That's yeah. art, though. Let's <laughs> just do the whole thing. Yeah. I mean... But does that does that clash with Rick's view from the audience perspective? Because like obviously a six minute song is hard to listen to, digest. Whatever, you know what I mean? You can't listen to a six minute song on the radio. I know it was tough. We we really tried to consider all the all the possibilities for that song, and we did cut it down a couple times. It just never felt right. Um, it just didn't tell the story. You know, it's like I don't know. Sometimes the cliff notes just don't cut it for some novels or books or stories. Totally. Um, so we just kept it how it is. For the sake of the story. Yeah. Listen to it. It's waiting for you. Link below. You good? Uh, preferably in a body of water, if you can. Yeah. Listen to it in a body of water. <laughs> I always think when I was listening to it, I was like, this is great for a Sunday outside. Being by a pool makes perfect sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's waiting for you. You also mentioned you're not a rapper. And speaking of Rick Rubin, like you got that Run DMC look going on today. That's <laughs> yeah. nice. I like this. Yeah, I'm trying to, you know. Uh, I fuck with the chops, too. Oh, yeah, thanks. Oh. I can't grow a beard, but these come in pretty strong. <laughs> um, yeah, man, I mean, I'm trying to integrate, like, this, like, early 90s, late 80s hip-hop fashion into, like, my my uh, my twang thing. I call it, I call it twangle fashion. It's, it's working. <laughs> Instead of kangol. Yeah. <laughs> That's it's, good. Yeah, keep it up. Thanks. Hey, you're doing something. You really give time with. Yeah. So. Thanks, man. Something's going on. Let's keep being you. I appreciate you. You it was too. Really, really nice meeting you. You too. This was great. Yeah, this was fun. Mood swings. Listen to it. It's waiting below. Uh, Marcus Hing, everybody. And Duck. Oh, Duck. Yeah, <laughs> duck. That means <laughs> <laughs>